Okay. Uh, <clears throat> let me, before I introduce the S procedure, let me first uh, give you some examples, <clears throat> more examples. So let you see why optimization is the king or is the key to help you think about them various kind of problems, almost every problem, okay? Suppose I have a so-called eigenvalue optimization problem. <clears throat> Suppose I have a few symmetric matrix A1, A2, A0, A1, A2, A, AM, and I define a somehow affine combinations or uh, somehow linear combination of these eights, okay? And I want you to find the weights such that the overall, this will be a matrix, okay? And I want you to minimize the maximum eigenvalue of the matrix. Why this is useful? Why care about eigenvalue? Eigenvalue is, it determines many properties. For example, if this is a system matrix, the max eigenvalue will determine whether it's stable or not, right? If the maximum angle value is less than zero, then the system is stable in continuous time, right? You need to make sure angle value is less than zero, right? So oftentimes you need to play with those coefficients to make sure your system is stable. You want to minimize the maximum angle values, okay? So <clears throat> others could be other cases uh, for communication signal processing. Oftentimes you need the you need, uh, to deal with eigenvalues or singular values as well. Um, so the question can be, I mean, if you think about this only math problem, uh, what we are trying to do is minimize of uh, max, lambda max of this S W. Minimize over W, W are the weights. Why this expression makes sense even? Because all of these are Symmetric, okay? And the symmetric matrices, all the angle values are real. You don't have a complex number. So you can say you minimize or maximize the angle values, right? <clears throat> if I have a complex number, it's hard for you to say which one is the largest angle value. You have a real number, you can, you can alter them completely. So I want to do this, okay. Uh, but how how we can solve this one? Is this a, a what kind of how how do I formulate this problem? Uh, <clears throat> let's uh, first recall what we review from lecture eleven. Lambda max as omega. Suppose. I don't know what it is, but let's suppose it's less than a beta, a number. From our previous review, we know this is the same, say, as uh, this matrix less than, I mean, this is a, this uh, is not a, uh, it's kind of curly less than n. Do you remember this? That means S omega or W minus beta I is negative semi-definite. That's a property for symmetric matrix that we proved, proved on lecture 11. <clears throat> if you forgot, you can just uh, read that lecture note. And the way we prove this is always by using a very important property or symmetric matrix, right? the spectral decomposition can always be used to prove almost everything related to a symmetric matrix. <clears throat> okay, so you, if you ask this angle value, maximum angle value less than beta, then it's equal to say this guy is positive, a uh, negative semi-definite. Now I can formulate the following way. Okay, I'm a, I'm a, I can construct the following optimization problem. I will minimize the upper bound, beta. Okay. First of all, I can. This guy is a nonlinear 
if you directly look at this, it's a nonlinear optimization. Okay, and also maybe non-convex. Because if you want to say, you want to find the expression in terms of omega, you need to find the eigenvalue formula for, for this matrix expressed with respect to omega. And you also need to rank the eigenvalues. You need to find the largest one. So this guy is really a very complex formula in terms of omega. So, 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 so this guy will be, if you write this guy as a f omega directly with respect to the optimization variable will be very complicated. Are you with me? It's very complicated. Uh, so you even don't have this formula, but based on this relation, we can equivalently formulate this problem as the following, minimize beta and omega. These are two lifting, okay? Two variables subject to S omega minus beta I less than or equal to zero. Okay, if I write it down more explicitly, it will be A zero plus omega one, A one, all the way to omega N, uh, how many? Well, I'm going to M, A M minus beta I less than or equal to zero. What I'm claiming is that this is a alamai in omega and beta, right? Any questions? A zero and all the other A's are given. So overall, this guy is a what is this problem called? Uh, this is SDP. Minimize a linear function of variable subject to linear machine inequality. This is a SDP. And you can type in this a few lines of code, you can find it. Any questions? Okay, so depending on how you formulate the problem, the problem nature can be different. So this is a SDP, we can do it. Now we have a geometric problem. Okay, suppose I have a, a set. This set is defined as this. I'm not sure whether you can recognize. This is a ellipsoid. Okay, center right C. So it will be like a uh, ellipsoid. This is my center, okay? So I want to find the point in E that is the closest to the origin. Suppose I have a coordinate system. This is my coordinate system. What do I want to find is I want to find the nearest point inside this E. So that's my E, right? I want to find any point uh, maybe some point will have a distance like this, some point this, this, right? You can find a lot of uh, lines, and uh, roughly speaking, maybe this point is the shortest or closest point, but you want to find it. <clears throat> so the problem will be, let's say this is a problem. How do you formulate the problem? I want to minimize over, let's say this is the, my, so all the point, right? I can look for all the point in this Rn, this is Rn, right? So I minimize the norm, get sorted distance is just the norm of the point. I want to minimize over X, but I want to look for its norm, uh, let's say squared. All the norm is convex function, right? That's what I discussed last time. So this is convex, but I have a constraint. If I just write this, then the solution is x equal to zero, right? So I can, I, I need to make sure x is inside this ellipsoid. So how do we do it? It's subject to 
x minus xc to this constraint, right? Transpose times r x minus xc uh, less than or equal to zero. Let's let's do this, okay? So is this a convex problem? So far, the optimization variable is uh, is uh, is x, right? It actually is, but we can we need to change uh, the way it looks. So, <clears throat> so this equality, this inequality condition is equivalent to one minus this is a scalar, right? After do the this quadratic form, gave you a scalar value. This guy is bigger equal to zero. Okay, any questions? Um, <clears throat> but it's not linear in with respect to x. It's quadratic with respect to x. What we should do? Sure, complement lemma. That's, uh, I'm not sure, I, I'm sure. I was, I, I'm sure you don't remember them. It's not that I'm not sure, but uh, let's say complement lemma because I don't remember the formula. Suppose this is m, this is a, b, B transpose C bigger zero equivalent to equivalent to what? Uh, equivalent to A is this and uh, C minus B transpose A inverse B is bigger than it's not negative. Okay. Ah, let's do a little bit matching. What do you think? So this is a quadratic term, right? I should match with this. This is a quadratic. Then uh, I will do a pattern recognition by myself, which I think is C is one. Okay, C is one. And I want, uh, I want uh, A, this is A inverse. I want A inverse to be R. Okay, and also want the B to be this guy. So X minus X minus XC. So you may say, ah, B is become a vector. Of course, fine. Vector is a special matrix. Vector is just a N by one matrix, right? It doesn't matter. By doing this, we can say, this one is equivalent to what? A becomes R inverse now, okay? And X minus XC is X minus XC transpose, and this is one, which is, okay. Now this guy is A alamai with respect to in, X variable. X is a n by one matrix or n by one vector. Okay, so this is not really a SDP, but because the cost function is a, it's a quadratic, but it's still a convex optimization problem. Uh, there's numerous solvers can be used to solve it. Okay, so you can solve it to find a point. So most of geometric property things can be translated into an optimization problem. Any questions so far? That's a geometric problems. Uh, now we move to the main kind of problem that we are looking for is how to do stability analysis and the, and the control design. Let's look at this one. <laughs> So given a linear control system with linear feedback control law, which is uh, u equal to kx. So typically we have a negative kx, but anyway, let's say, let's stick with this uh, <clears throat> k. So the question I'm asking you is, can you find a k to stabilize the system? Of course, if you take modern control theory, you can, you can design this k in different ways. You can do pole placement, 
you can do LQR, right? But let's today use uh, Leofton functions and uh, LMIs to solve or find it. Okay. Let's look at this. So let's say a closed loop system. What I mean by closed loop is that plug in this control law into the system, which I have x dot equal to ax plus bu. u is kx, right? That's a closed loop dynamics, which I have a plus bk x. Typically, I have a special name for it. I call a closed loop. Okay, so this guy is stable. As I mentioned before, is equivalent to say it has a quadratic Leopold function. There are many ways you can you can you can check this for linear system. You have kind of a luxury to use different uh, result, <clears throat> but let's take a Leopold function view. So that means I can find exists a p positive definite such that uh, we already derived it before. I don't want to repeat them. A plus b k. That's my closed loop transpose p plus p times a minus b k is less than zero. Right. P is positive definite observability, and then the closed loop dynamics has to be the value has to decrease. That's this. If that's the case, then this kind of implies v of x is a Lyapunov function for closed loop system. Okay. Well, that's what well, you need to look for p and k, and also k, right? We don't know k yet. P and K to satisfy this. <clears throat> uh, let me give a remark that's typically useful. We know linear system. Uh, for linear system, let's say for linear system, asymptotic stability, asymptotic stable, is equivalent to exponential stable. Okay. So for linear system, it, if it's stable, it's just exponential stable. Okay. For the optimal function, function, uh, <clears throat> exponential stability, uh, let's say the optimal function like a Vx equal to x transpose Px, right? <clears throat> Need to satisfy uh, yep. Stability requires, let's say, need to be, uh, let me say it this way. What guaranteed exponential stability you require V dot less than negative alpha V. Okay, that's what we somehow discussed. Actually, we proved it. I said it's a comparison theorem. That's uh, <clears throat> kind of a linear scalar differential equation. Um, that give you this result. That's a very important property or condition that you need to play with when you do LMIs. Okay, so in in this particular case, that means this means uh, v dot is actually v dot x is actually x transpose a closed loop transpose p plus p a closed loop uh, let's say close loop, okay, times x, right, and less than equal to negative alpha times x transpose p of x. Okay, so if I want to do this, then instead of imposing this, I can impose a little bit more kind of uh, stronger and the more numerically stable actually. It's A closed loop transpose 
P plus P A closed loop and uh, plus alpha P less than or equal to zero. This is our, this less than or equal to is a scalar less than or equal to, and this is really semi-definite, okay, negative semi-definite. And if you plug in, let's see. So uh, <clears throat> if you do this, let's say that, sorry. This is equivalent to say A plus BK transpose P plus P times A plus BK plus alpha P is less than or equal to zero. Okay, of course, this alpha need to be bigger than zero, okay? So some kind of uh, exponent, exponential, conver exponential convergence rate. Is this a LMI, Yangxing? In, well, our variable is what? Variable is P and K. We don't know what P is, we don't know K is. They are both variables. Right, you're looking for, you, you're given A and B, that's it. You're looking for a K to stabilize it. And the way you look for it is find a, a Lyapunov function for the closed loop system under this K. So you both need to look for P and also K. Is this a alamai in P and K? No, why? Yes, these are some kind of loss terms that are bilinear, okay? In this case, it's hard to do super complement lemma, but we can easily do that by changing variables. So sometimes you need to smart to manipulate those things. <clears throat> I don't like tricks that much, but some tricks are important. You can build them as a fact, okay? Um, what do we do is that let's 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 uh, pre multiply p one or p inverse of this times p inverse transpose. Suppose this is my uh, this this is my this. Okay, let's call it f alpha p and k. Alpha is also not known yet, okay? So there's a variable of alpha. Let's say that's alpha as well, sorry. Alpha, P, and K. Uh, what I do is that I want that to be negative definite. This is F, alpha, P, and K. But what I do is that I do a congruent transformation. All I need to do is that P pre-multiplied by P inverse and times P inverse transpose. But P is symmetric. So P inverse transpose is also P inverse. Okay, I hope that's fine. And then what else? Uh, if I multiply this here, P inverse here goes to P inverse A. If you multiply P inverse because this uh, transpose, it has no effect because this thing is symmetric. From the right, this guy is gone. Okay, so the first term is P inverse A, that's it. Oh, sorry, transpose, right? Transpose going inside, plus P inverse K, K transpose, B transpose. Ah. Do you agree? The second term, P A, P inverse A, P inverse times K transpose, B transpose, because this P canceled off, it's from here. And what else? Plus, P inverse times this guy is gone, then you only have the from the right. So what I have A times P inverse plus BK times P inverse, right? And plus alpha, P inverse, P inverse, you have two P inverse, one P, so you have one P inverse left. Less than or equal to zero, okay? <clears throat> okay, if I do this, trick, not trick, or some kind of a manipulation, then uh, I'm left with uh, 
let's call this guy, uh, A is given, right? This guy is my, let's call that X. Let's define this as X, right? This guy is X. And I also call this guy, this guy is my Y. Let's define that as Y. X is a P inverse, Y is P inverse times K transpose, okay? Uh, in this case, this is my X. What about this case? This is a Y transpose. Okay. This is Y, this is Y trans, uh, if you do that again, this is Y transpose because P is symmetric. And this is my X. So if I redefine variable in terms of X and Y, I have a linear matrix inequality in X and Y. Ruben, do you agree? Okay. So after this fact, I can I can formulate a problem which is minimize. Uh, let's say minimize over negative alpha. I want it to be maximize alpha. Alpha is bigger means it converts faster. Okay, so typically minimize negative alpha, alpha k and p, subject to, uh, not, not, not k and p, let's say x and y. Okay, subject to this guy, which is, let's call that g of alpha, x and y. So let's say g of alpha, x and y, less than equal to zero, this is a lima, a, a lima, and alpha is bigger than zero. That's convergence rate. What else? And also, I want the <clears throat> P to be positive definite, P inverse also positive definite. So I want X to be positive definite. That's pretty much it. Okay, I don't think I have other constraints. <clears throat> okay, so that's a, a this is also a uh, SDP. This is SDP. Okay. So today you have learned almost entire alumni based control design theory. I think from here foundation you can you can you can basically read uh, more advanced stuff, but you need some time to actually absorb those information, understand them well. Okay, um, that's it for today. Okay, let's uh, try to finish this lecture today. Last time, last week, we uh, mainly introduced the SDPs, semi-definite program, okay? Which is a linear program subject to a linear matrix inequality constraint. And the first thing I, I spent quite some time to explain is what we mean by linear matrix inequalities. Uh, I hope you still remember. If you don't, you need to review. And it's actually very important. I gave you several examples. Some of them involve uh, uh, stability analysis. In particular, this example, looking for a Lyapunov function, okay? The Lyapunov condition has two conditions, right? The first one is the function has to be positive definite. I call it quote unquote observability condition that all the bad behaviors have to show up in the, the, the function value of the Lyapunov function. And we also need the derivative of the Lyapunov the function with respect to vector field has to be negative definite. These two combined together give us two uh, conditions on P, right? Here is a condition on P, it's P is positive definite. Another, uh, the second one corresponds to this kind of condition. If A is known, then this is also impose a condition on P. And this condition is, if you view P as a decision variable, is also a, is a linear matrix inequality constraint. Okay, that's what we explained last time. Uh, why is that? You can basically transform it into the standard form that uh, we introduced uh, before, right? At the beginning. So it's a, 
of linear mapping of some decision variable is maps from decision uh, vector to uh, a matrix, some definite matrix, and then require that matrix to be part of some definite. That's a linear matrix inequality constraint. Okay, we give some examples <clears throat> on this. Uh, let's first look at how um, it's a kind of a review and also called uh, as an exercise. Let's look for a Lyapunov function by solving a LMI feasibility problem, okay, using Drake. Um, <clears throat> all we need to look for is that given the A matrix, I need to find whether I can simultaneously, I can find the P simultaneously satisfy these two constraints. Okay, if that's true, then I can find the Lyapunov function. If that's not true, I cannot find one. For a linear system, this is if and only if condition. If this is stable, then I can always find a quadratic Lyapunov function represented by this P matrix. If it's not stable, then I cannot find one. So the feasibility of this two set of linear matrix inequalities give us sufficient necessary condition for system to be stable. Okay. Uh, I may ask Yinghan, what do you think if I give it continuous time system, let's say autonomous system without control, x dot equal to ax, uh, what's the condition to ensure its stability? No, for a, the angle value of so a need to be open life half plane. Okay, the real part of this, uh, the angle value has to be negative, right? So that's the stability, and that should be equivalent to the feasibility of these two linear matrix inequalities. Are you with me? That's what we're going to check. Um, Drake is the place that you can do everything related to control and robotics. So we just stick to one toolbox. We don't need to install other packages anything. Uh, so here's the example. Suppose I have a matrix. Um, uh, let me see whether I, it's, I'm in the right environment. Let me load all these things. I think I did that already. Okay. That's our previous example to do uh, uh, optimization. That's a linear program. But now let's see how we can do the uh, SDP, semi-definite uh, program. So it's, here is the example that's P, uh, A is this matrix, and the eigenvalue of A is negative two and negative one. In Han, is that stable or not? Stable. Okay, it's stable. So according to our theory, we should be able to find at least one P that satisfy. I can look, I can find a quadratic Lyapunov function, right? In order to do this, there's many different ways we can do it. Okay, I can define a mathematical program. Now I need to claim a matrix decision variable, which is, uh, and also impose symmetric constraint. It's called a new symmetric continuous variable P, uh, or sorry, two dimension. That means two by two symmetric matrix. Okay, if you run this to, uh, if I do that, let me do that first one by one. If you do this, you actually have uh, a symbolic thing. If you look at it, it's a variable. Um, and you know that, uh, let me see, how many decision variable we have. You see that they already impose constraints. So this is a zero, zero, one, one, that's two independent decision variable. And the diagonal part is, one zero one zero is have three decision variables. Okay, it's already imposed the symmetric constraint. That's what this claim means. Then I can add cost. I don't have to add any cost, but in this case, if you look at this uh, equation, P is part of definite. Uh, if I find the P satisfied is two condition, then two P also satisfied is two condition. You see what I mean? Right? If you scale this, suppose I find P satisfy this, then 2P is also positive definite. Then 2P is just two times this, will make this more negative definite. 
right? So there's an infinite number of them. So I don't want to have too large P. So I try to minimize uh, those uh, terms. It's, I don't think we, well, this is arbitrary pick some cost function. The key is that we need to make sure it satisfies the constraint. Uh, the first one is uh, this constraint is called positive semi-definite constraint. Whatever inside this bracket, uh, the parentheses, need to be a positive definite matrix or semi-definite matrix. So in this case, I want P to be positive semi-definite or positive definite. So I, I, I don't care how, how uh, I buy there's some kind of a numerical tolerance I need to make sure. I don't want to be exactly zero because zero is the solution. If you, if you look at this, uh, if, you don't, if you don't care about positive definite, say purely semi-definite, then zero will be a solution. But we want asymptotic stability. I want to be strictly positive definite, right? And uh, so it needs to be a little bit bigger than zero. So there's some tolerance here. And also this is A transpose P, P times A need to be negative definite, right? So I just take a negative sign and this become another positive semi-definite or positive definite condition. Okay, adding these two, then I can solve it. And this is the solution we got, we call it result P. And I can tell whether the, 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 the program find a feasible P or not. If I run it, it says two, I find one, this is my P. And this P is symmetric, first of all, it's positive definite, it satisfies all the constraints, okay? But if you want, uh, if you say, let's just change another A matrix, suppose my A matrix is this, now the eigenvalue is uh, in high, is this stable or not? No. So you have a negative stable eigenvalue, you have a positive, which is unstable eigenvalue, right? Then I can, I can do the same kind of thing, I run it again, false. It does not, cannot find any P satisfy this, okay, if and only if. So just a few lines of code, you can construct the optimal functions. This is the trivial or, or most simple straightforward example to illustrate how you can solve SDP to construct the optimal functions. Of course, the problem you encounter in real life uh, application or even homework will be much more challenging than this one, right? So I do the easy one, you do the hard one. Any questions? You can see that just these three lines of code solve SDP. That's very simple. Okay. All right, let's go back to our lecture. Let's continue. Uh, hold on, sorry. Uh, he's here, right? Let's continue. I think we've almost finished everything except here. We need to discuss the so-called S procedure which is another useful tool for stability analysis, especially. Uh, <clears throat> let me give you some background, first of all. Uh, hold on, I need to move myself up. Using mouse. Uh, from the example we just reviewed and also our discussion from last week, I think uh, for the optimal function condition, let's say the optimal function condition, condition so far, we always require, let's say V uh, is PD and V dot is ND. Right. Okay, so these actually those conditions, those are imposed on the entire base space. Okay, you need that to be positive definite over the entire space. So all the part, all the state has to be uh, giving you these definite conditions. But uh, for many application advanced, for example, <clears throat> for example, I say 
How about, suppose that's my R2, okay? X1, X2. Uh, if I want to say n dot is negative definite, so any point here, the v value has to decrease, okay? Or v dot has to be, the derivative of v has to be negative. Okay, that's the condition we require, but that's a little bit too strong sometimes. So sometimes what about, I want to say, suppose I know, suppose I know my system has some physical meaning. I only need maybe, I only need v to be decreasing. I know I only lie in these sectors, suppose. How do we ensure conditions that I want, for example, how about, uh, or let's not use how about, what if, what if we need V dot less than zero only inside these sectors. I don't need to be entire space to be positive definite or negative definite. I only need to be sign definite within some kind of a set. Okay, that's often needed. You have any questions? Sectors. Sectors. How should we do it? Okay, that's a motivating example. Then I need to go a little bit about this particular example. I need to tell you mathematically what we are trying to do is the following, okay? This requires, let's say, let me first tell you the answer is one useful tool, uh, I would say a useful tool is the S precisor. Uh, let me change my line. It's the so-called S procedure. Okay, that's what we are going to discuss today. It's pretty straightforward, pretty simple, and there's many versions of it. I'm going to give you the the general, most general procedure because that's not too hard. Okay. So let me jump a little bit outside of the stability thing. Let's just go back to map what essentially we're trying to do. So many stability engineering problems require to certify a given function is signed definite over a certain subset of space. So V is PD, that's a special case, means, uh, means V is positive definite, right? Positive sign definite over entire Rn, okay? But it could be we need, this is special case, right? That's recur Rn, but could be I want uh, only holds for some reasons. For example, I could say, <clears throat> what about I want V to be, or some function to be definite within this region? What kind of problem we are asking, okay? Mathematical term, what we're trying to say or conclude is the following. We want to make sure a function, here is V. Now I use a little bit change in notation here. I want to G zero is my function, target function. To be positive, always sign definite means it's always bigger than equal to zero, okay? I want this to be sign, this is the sign definite, right? Sign definite. But not on the entire Rn, only on the subset. How do we represent set? Using function to represent set, right? Using level set to represent set. So <clears throat> uh, we can state this for uh, the, 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 the formula is that I want G0 to be always non-negative on this set. And this set can be represented, any set, okay? Can be represented by a few kind of, uh, by a inequality constraint set, which is a level set, a sub-level set or super-level set. So suppose I want, whenever these are intersection of the few constraint set, you see what I mean? G1 X bigger than equal to zero impose a set. 
OG is a fine function that will be some kind of half space, right? That's a half space. And this is another half space. I want the intersection of all this half space. I want to make sure that's the, 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 the reason. Whenever I'm inside here, I want, I want G0 to be non-negative. If I'm not inside here, then I don't care. Could be positive, could be negative. I don't impose additional constraints. Okay, in general, I can represent this. Of course, I can call this one to be G X bigger equal to zero. These are element things. These are vector zero in this case. Okay, but anyway, let's write it in this form. Okay. So if I change my wording, it's the, it's the following. I, I'm giving you a few functions, G0 to GM. What I want is that we want to know whether conditions this G1 up to GM holds uh, whether, oh, hold on. Uh, well, I, whether this condition four holds or something, okay? Whether it's so. <clears throat> Um, how do you guarantee that? So whenever G1 up to GM is non-active, I can conclude G0 is non-active. So that's essentially what this condition means. Let me repeat that again. Whenever G1 up to GM is non-active, then G0 is non-active. If you divide the, the space into certain regions, whenever there's a region, there's a particular domain or region subset in the space, this M functions are non-active, then I can conclude the G0 is also non-active. That's basically what I, we are looking for or asking. Uh, <clears throat> this is almost trivial or sufficient uh, but conservative, but a very useful condition is called generalized as procedure is the following. So this can be guaranteed. I would say four can be guaranteed. Guaranteed. If there exists, uh, I would say if there exists a positive semi-definite functions, this is called multiplier functions. Uh, it could be a constant, could be also state dependent, doesn't matter. If you can find, you know this guy is positive semi-definite. Okay, this is a positive semi-definite functions. There's a PSD on Rn, okay? It's non-negative. For example, two or three, if that function is, is always positive semi-definite on the entire space, if I can find those things, such that this inequality holds, then I can conclude four. Okay, if you move things around, you can see that easily. So a, this condition means G zero is bigger or equal to summation I, I si X, G I of X. Is me? What does this mean? Okay. Suppose I find this SI is always non-negative, all right? So that's the condition. Then I can conclude for any X, whenever all these GIs are non-negative, then this sum will also be a summation of few non-negative numbers. Okay, so I can, then I can conclude this condition will ensure GI is also non-negative. This is a conservative and sufficient condition to ensure four. Okay, under very special cases, it's also lossless in the sense you can go other way. Okay, four always implies you can find this one, but that's not, uh, that's for a lot of other discussions. And this is a so-called generalized S procedure. Okay. If you want to guarantee that, you need to find some kind of positive definite functions to insert this, okay? Let's look at a little bit, kind of uh, <clears throat> zoom in a little bit to the special class, which we care a lot, which is a quadratic functions. Now suppose GIs are quadratic functions, quadratic functions 
can be written in this form, X transpose capital G I X. <clears throat> in this case, then uh, re requirement for or condition for just becomes whenever this, uh, let's call that M, okay? This is this M, okay? Whenever this M, G1 up to GM is positive or non-active. These four field functions are non-active. Then I can imply G0 is non-active for this X. So condition four require us to ensure whenever this holds, this holds. Okay. And this uh, <clears throat> a sufficient condition as procedure is that, uh, let's look at the state independent multiplier which exists alpha one up to alpha m such that G zero is bigger or equal to this, right? This uh, implies, let me see whether I have another condition. Uh, no. So let's, let's try that, okay? So suppose if, uh, if this star, if star holds, then for any x, any x, okay, we have uh, x transpose g zero x because this guy is bigger equal to this in the positive sum and definite sense. That means for any x, this guy is bigger equal to summation i alpha i x transpose g i x. Okay, that's for any x. So that means, so this means uh, this guy, so, so, so this means g zero x is non-active on sets at least we can conclude that Rn such that x transpose g i x bigger or equal to zero i equal to one up to m. Johan, does this make sense to you? Oh. Oh. Then I'm going to ask you, is this G0, if this G0 satisfies this, is this G0, capital G0, uh, let's say, is, is G0 positive semi-definite? Ready, move on. If G zero is positive semi definite, I don't need to ensure. I don't need to have any additional. If G zero positive semi definite, then for all x, is this thing is positive semi definite? Of course, it also satisfies this condition. So I well not necessary. The answer is not necessary. G zero may not need to be positive definite. Okay, it only need to be positive definite on these subdomains. Okay, this subset. Okay, that's all we need to, to ensure. That's why we need to ask procedure. If G zero is a positive semi definite, I don't need to have any additional constraints. It's always positive, non negative. So on any subset, it will also be non-active, right? So it's, this condition is trivially holds. Now I want to relax that strong assumption. G0 is not part of semi definite, but I'm happy, I will be happy, or it suffices for me to make sure G0, X transpose G0 X is non-active on certain subset. And the subset is given by this. So, <clears throat> okay. Uh, as per teacher is a lossless in this case, okay, if m equal to one, in that case, uh, what I mean is that I only have, uh, so you want to ensure, uh, 
uh, hold on, what, what, what I say that's uh, country qualification. And, oh, this is a country qualification, right? So if you have m equal to one, you only have one thing. So you want to make sure, you want to make sure, so, so what I mean is that, let's, let's do that. In this case, in this case, uh, <clears throat> x transpose x bigger or equal to zero guarantees x zero bigger or equal to zero. So that's in entire condition, this thing is equivalent to, uh, is equivalent to there exists a alpha one such that uh, G of zero bigger or equal to alpha one G one. So these two things, these two block are equivalent. In this case, irrelevant. This is called the loss list. Otherwise, this is only a sufficient condition. I'm not sure whether you can read this uh, this uh, expression. I do not want to explain that too much. So this condition means whenever x, you're looking for different x. Okay, in the part of the space where x transpose g1 x is non-negative, always make sure x transpose g0 x is non-negative. So that's the requirement. That's what this condition means. And this condition means uh, in, if loss in this case, that's equivalent to exist a alpha one such that g0 is bigger equal to alpha one uh, g1. The generalized procedure is a, a sufficient condition that from here you can definitely imply this, but not the other way around. If I'm equal to one, that's a loss list. Okay, <clears throat> more you need, only need to know, at least for this class, uh, the sufficient part, okay. You know, I'm gonna ask you again. Um, Exist alpha one such that G zero bigger or equal to alpha one times G one. Uh, <clears throat> do you think G one, G zero is positive, definite? No, how could that be? Uh, let, me, let me tell you, okay. Maybe I confused you. I thought it's simple. <clears throat> For example, let's say G zero, it's uh, one zero negative one. Okay, you like number? I will give you a number G zero. G one is uh, uh, one zero zero. Uh, let's say also negative one. Oh, let me think negative two. Let's say that. Is G zero positive seven definite or not? No, that means there's some part of the space X transpose G zero X is negative. Okay, but in this case, G zero minus, uh, let's see, uh, let's hold on. Uh, well, this is not, well, anyway, so this is to be, G zero, let's say alpha times one zero zero negative two should be bigger equal to zero. Let me see whether we can find such alpha. Can we? What about alpha uh, point, point four, uh, point seven? Uh, no. Is that true? Let's see, that will be giving me point three zero zero. Uh, Point four, right? Is that true? So this guy satisfied this condition. So this guy is positive seven definite. Okay, I'm finding the alpha. So this condition is satisfied. Okay, this condition is satisfied. All I can conclude is that, well, first of all, my observation that G zero is 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 not positive seven definite. But what I can conclude that whenever, so then I can conclude whenever. 
x satisfies x transpose g one x bigger equal to zero. I we always have x transpose g zero x bigger equal to zero. That's what we can guarantee. So for example, example of example, suppose I have x hat, which is uh, <clears throat> one zero, okay? The next hat is satisfies what? The next hat transpose g one x hat equal to one. In this case, okay, it satisfy my constraints. Uh, then I can always guarantee you can check g zero always also bigger than g zero, right? What about x one, uh, x hat one? Let's say zero, maybe negative one. Is this okay? Anyway, I don't want to repeat that. I think that's good enough. Not the entire space has to be part definite. Only on a certain part of the space, you want to import that definite condition. Ubernets, any questions? <clears throat> okay. Um, now let's uh, look at another example, which is the robust stability example. The problem we're trying to solve is a little bit more challenging than what we have done before. Let's suppose I have a system, a linear system, linear control system. I assume that I have an identity or whatever the B matrix. Uh, <clears throat> suppose I have this is x dot equal to ax plus u. I have state feedback. Okay, this is my u with a certain state feedback law, which is u equal to g of x. So I don't know uh, what my u is, and maybe some feedback channel is kind of corrupted by noise. I don't know exactly its form, but all I know is satisfy certain properties, which is the feedback control as a function of x satisfies this sector constraint. Okay, so if you look at this constraint, it tells us, uh, suppose this is my X norm. Um, this tells us basically like this, sector form. Uh, if this is my G of X, the norm, okay. So the gain has some, so if you look at this, that's a gain, right? So how much the X, if, for example, let's say, if GX is K times X, that's a gain, right? This is a gain, but you're not certain about the gain. The gain can vary within certain kind of a sector bound. So I don't know which gain I'm going to use. Uh, even may not be linear, by the way. So it could be, the function could be something like this. It does not need to be a line, right? But that's the quantify our kind of uncertainty about this feedback loop. Uh, so if I want to draw that, that means X will be used to design my controller. My controller is a nonlinear function, which is G of X. And I don't know for sure what GX is. This is my U. Uh, <clears throat> so the question is that I'm going to ask you whether the system is stable or not. Whether the system closed loop, so this is a closed loop system. Whether this closed loop system is robust, stable or not, means that whenever this condition satisfies, no matter how, how I design my actual control law, as long as this, this condition satisfied, 
then the overall system needs to be stable. So overall, the closed loop system, the dynamics is what? X dot equal to AX plus U, which is G of X. Okay, so this is our vector field and uh, <clears throat> Yao Xiong needs is this a linear or nonlinear? If gx is kx, is a linear, but it general in general is nonlinear, right? It's nonlinear in general. Nonlinear if g is nonlinear. Okay, it's a nonlinear vector field. It's not a function. I want to make sure it's robust stable. And we want to find the Lyapunov function to ensure that how should we state our requirement? You see that we are asking a question. So I'm asking a question. Okay, I design control law. Maybe my feedback gain. It's there's some kind of noise, or there's maybe I use circuit to implement implement my controller, and the circuit value can change over time. I'm not sure whether it's stay constant k or not but i know it won't change too much so there's uh, some condition is satisfied the game won't be bigger than beta you see what i mean the game won't be bigger than beta so that's roughly what it means uh, then i ask the question if that's the case whether my system is robust and stable so no matter how my parameter of my system change over time i can still ensure stability that's the question we are asking Okay. It's hard to analyze, but if you ask that, the first thing you need to make sure, or you can translate that to the stability results and optimization-based analysis tools we learned in this class. How should we do it? Um, then we are looking for a Lyapunov function. This is a sufficient condition may not be necessary. Um, <clears throat> let's say we want to look for a quadratic Lyapunov function. Let's, uh, let's say suppose, suppose Vx equal to x transpose Px is a Lyapunov function, but in this case, I want to have a ensure exponential stability, not typically wanting exponential stability. That's uh, especially optimization-based analysis tools, we often ensure exponential stability because that make everything a little bit simpler and also useful in practice. Uh, it's an exponential uh, Lyapunov function. Then we need the first condition, Yangxing, what is it? V is PD, which in pose of P, that means P is positive semi-definite, a uh, positive definite. Okay, suppose that's my Lyapunov function. Of course, this may not be a Lyapunov function. Well, we may not find, be able to find the P satisfy this, but that doesn't matter. We assume we're looking for such form of Lyapunov function. Suppose that's our goal. Then I need P to be positive definite. I also need what? I also need to, uh, let's, uh, let me, let me, two. It's v dot negative definite. Okay, but that tells us what is v dot. So closed loop. If I use u to represent this gx, so then I will say ax vector field u transpose this closed loop, right? P times x plus x transpose p a x plus u. Uh, hold on. Less than equal to negative alpha, that's exponential stability, x transpose p of x. Sorry, uh, what I want is v dot less than equal to alpha v. That's my exponential stability with convergence rate uh, 
not alpha, but V converts at least alpha, but also we need to infer that back to X, that another scaling factor. But anyway, this is exponential Lyapunov function condition. If you if you if you take derivatives, that's what you're going to get. That's the condition. Okay. Uh, so if I want to further kind of simplify the things, then I can write down things like this following. I transpose, if you take I transpose. Uh, here I can use that transpose times P times AX U as well, right? This is equal to X transpose P AX times U. <laughs> okay, so you can swap the order. Uh, what we have is the A, uh, hold on. Anyway, so I, I let me, A transpose P plus P A plus alpha p, here you have a alpha p move to the left, times x and plus the u term, okay, that term, plus two u transpose px, uh, that need to be less than equal to zero. Okay, you know u transpose px also equal to x transpose p times u. The scalar you can take transpose it will give you the same result. I arrange them in uh, to simplify some kind of uh, steps. Okay, suppose that you can see from here to here. Um, <clears throat> if you look at this as a, this is the condition we want to look for. Okay, we want to look for p satisfy this for. for all x, actually, okay? So if you want to make sure that condition, we can write it in terms of x and the u as together. So x and the u times negative a transpose p plus p a plus alpha p. And this is negative p, this is negative p, uh, this is zero, this is u, uh, sorry, X, you should be familiar with this later on, bigger equal to zero. I take the negative sign, okay? <clears throat> this is only for all X and the U from the closed loop system, okay? I want to make sure this is the derivative has to be negative along the system trajectory. Along the system trajectory, if you give me X, I will have a U, right? This X and U is not independent. They are related by G. For whatever this valid X and the U, I need to, uh, this need to be satisfied, okay? <clears throat> if I want to do that a little bit more, it's for all X and U such that what u equal to g of x. Okay, because g, u has to be g of x. Oh, you know, we take this form and we know, let me just spend a few more time. So we know u norm is less than equal to beta x norm. Again, it's bounded, or that's our assumption. So this tells us if you, because this is just quadratic constraint. So this is u transpose u, that's my u norm, uh, less minus beta x transpose x less than equal to zero. Any questions? If you write in terms of x u, this tells us I'm not sure whether you can recognize that or not. U x times beta identity zero zero negative i times u uh, x u x u big or equal to zero. I move my x to the right and the u to the right as well. Uh, you can see that 
x beta x minus u transpose times u bigger equal to zero. All right, x transpose beta x minus u transpose u bigger equal to zero. That means this. Okay, so this is my. Uh, I will call this my g of one. Okay, g of one. So all I want to make sure is the following. So by, so what I want is that we want, we want whenever this holds, let's call it two, uh, let's call it three maybe. Whenever this three holds, whenever three, then let's call that, uh, let's call that two, this need to hold. Let's not, let's not use three, let's use B. Whenever B holds, then this A, then A holds. Okay, I don't need this one to be called definite for all X and the U. I only need to ensure that condition whenever X and the U satisfy my condition, which is U equal to GX. Since U uh, G has some uncertainty, U and the G is satisfy this inequality and sorry, U and X satisfy this inequality, then this inequality can also be expressed by this quadratic inequality, which is uh, that. So by as procedure, we have, okay, there exists a tall bigger equal to zero hot player, non-negative multiplier such that uh, if I call that G zero, that's my G one. Okay, sorry, this is my, um, I have too many colors. This is my G1, and this is our G0, G0. Uh, G0. Okay, so such that uh, G0 is bigger or equal to tau G1. Okay, all I need to make sure is find that. And this can be formulated as a LMI or semi-definite program. That means we want to minimize, um, let's call it alpha, negative alpha. I want to maximize the convergence rate. So I minimize negative alpha uh, over the set of variable is P. And my multiplier is also something we don't know. How and alpha such that P subject to, let's say P, not negative or positive definite, tau is positive, and g0 minus tau uh, g1 is non positive definite, semi definite. Okay, if you look at this, this is g0, that's our g0. This is uh, LMI in P, linear matrix inequality in P, that's our. Uh, so G zero is a linear function of P, okay? Uh, I, would, I wouldn't say that out of my, it's linear in P, I see that, linear in P. And uh, this guy is a variable. Um, and also we know this G one is given, okay? Suppose beta is, uh, beta is given and G one is, everything is known. G one is given. So this thing, whole thing, this whole thing is a, Linear matrix inequality in P and tau. By just solving this, we show you how to do it using Drake already. By solving this, you can find better, suppose this one is feasible, then you find the Lyapunov function to ensure closed loop stability or robust closed loop stability. So you can, well, we will play with it in one of the homework. Okay. All right, uh, let's continue. There are a few typos. One is just Newman ask. This guy should be exist uh, alpha bigger equal to zero, okay? Of course, this is a, the multiplier has to be non-negative over the entire space. You know, if it's a, it's, a, it's a constant, it has to be part of the constant. That ensures the, as procedure to hold. And also, uh, Ping Han asked me why we have this. 
is just because, uh, let me add one more step, which is V dot equal to, V is X transpose P X, right? If you take derivative like X transpose dot times P times X plus X P X dot, oh, sorry, transpose X dot. The only X depend on, depend on P, P is constant. If you do this, X dot is the vector field, which is AX plus U. Okay, that's how I derive it. Let's skip this step. If you need, I will add this back in. All right, that's uh, enough. I think we have everything we, everything we need to know about SDP for stability analysis. Of course, it can be used for many other things. <clears throat> uh, geometric optimization, many, many examples. I hope uh, you will get a chance to practice a little bit more uh, in later homeworks after the midterm.